Welcome to our House of One prayer. We, Rabbi Andreas Nachama, Imam Osman Erz, and I, Pastor Gregor Hoberg, greet our guests from the United States. Rabbi Sonja Pilz and Aisha Keshkin Zaglam from New York, and Pastor Nancy Petty from Raleigh, North Carolina. You three are ambassadors of the House of One. You support the idea of the House of One. The occasion for the meeting is the current situation in the United States. At the same time, we know that there is racism and anti-Semitism in Germany too. In the House of One, a new kind of a sacred building in the center of Berlin, people of different religions and backgrounds will live together and they become jointly responsible for a peaceful coexistence for, of all people in which the dignity of everyone is respected. Today we want to speak out against the unequal treatment of people, against racism and anti-Semitism, and finally we will pray together. But first we want to hear Sonia, how have you experienced the past weeks? And we as representatives of the religions are doing enough against racism and for peaceful coexistence. What do you think? For the last weeks, I have been very much stuck at home. I think the last time I was in Manhattan was March 16th. Um, and since then, I'm entirely home office based except for small trips to the supermarket and some walking tours in the neighborhood. Um, I work from here remotely for an organization that um, is equally old and equally radical, if you want to put it this way, um, because it's the heart of American reform Judaism, which has been driven from the get-go by social justice engagement. So it's not a surprise that a lot of our work right now during the last one or two weeks um, has been evolving around the question of racism, anti-racism work, um, colorism. And I, I want to share this here. It is, I think, one of the main and remarkable features of Reform Judaism in general that already for decades, there has been a very high awareness of something that in the States is called colorism, also within the Jewish community. Because similar to Israel, the American Jewish community is widely diverse. There are Jews of all skin colors. And we have been incredibly sensitized over the last years already <clears throat> to the inherent prejudice that Jews of color are sometimes facing within the broader Jewish community. And the CCAR has been on the forefront to teach, to educate, to converse, <clears throat> and to foster active engagement of its community members and especially clergy members to um, deconstruct those prejudices. We have a number of task forces working on those and many of our rabbis, <clears throat> excuse me, many of our rabbis are marching these days um, with the protesters around the country. Um, I personally, um, watching, the, I watch the fireworks and I've been watching the police helicopters in front of my um, apartment building at the beginning of <clears throat> the demonstrations. Um, I think still very much from the perspective of a guest, um, as I, you know, I'm still an immigrant. I don't have a green card. I'm not a citizen. Um, so personally attending political demonstration is always somewhat of, um, a risk to me personally, but um, in my work on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm very much part of this conversation. Dear Nancy, a question to you. You are a leading Christian, or you are leading a Christian congregation and said that you have been deeply involved in the Black Lives Matter protests over the past weeks. What is your focus with respect to your responsibility on how to be an anti-racist congregation? And what are the challenges? First of all, I think um, 
for Christian churches in America, we have to acknowledge that America's original sin is the sin of racism. And to that, uh, it is our responsibility as the Christian church to first speak words of confession that we have participated in this sin. We have been complicit in uh, our repentance of this sin. And um, that is the first word that we need to acknowledge and the first act that we need to take. Um, we also need to lament. We need to lament that uh, we have been silent and uh, we need to lament the harm, uh, the injustice that has been uh, done to black people and people of color and indigenous people in our country for over 400 years. And so that is the, the first thing that I as a Christian minister, uh, a white Christian minister in this country, uh, I have to acknowledge and accept and, and, and give voice to. I um, also think that we know, I mean, Dr. King also said it during the civil rights movement is that the white Christian clergy has been far too silent in standing up and speaking out against racism and standing with our black and brown brothers and sisters in the fight for justice for all people. Um, as I lead my congregation, my specific congregation, one of the first things that has become important for us to do is for me to lead my staff in doing the work that we have to do to be anti-racist individuals. We all have hidden biases. We all in some way hold these racist views and these racist ideologies. And so as individual ministers, we have to be prepared and willing to do our individual work to acknowledge that and to, uh, and to work toward our own, reducing our own biases and eliminating them. And then from that point, as leaders, we have to help our congregation do this work in terms of understanding the history, understanding our biases, how our churches are um, racist in some sense, that we have to dig deep and find those hidden ballast, uh, biases. So one of the things I'm doing within my church is uh, requesting an audit an analysis and an audit of our institution, all of our policies and procedures to see where those hidden biases lie so that we can work toward becoming an anti-racist congregation. So all of these things are happening on, on, on parallel tracks on mul multiple levels. So we're trying to work on our individual uh, biases where we hold these racist views and ideologies. Then we have to work with our congregation to face those and to, to eradicate them from our very institution. And then we have to figure out while we're doing those things, how can we be activists? Uh, my church has a deep history in social activism, social justice activism. And so where are we being called now? How do we discern the places where we're being called to actually put our bodies on the line to fight policy. It begins with, with changing policy in our country. Um, but how do, we, how do we focus those efforts on certain policies like, um, like health care, voting rights, uh, income inequality that faces black and brown people in our nation. And so those are where we're focusing our energies. I, I think it's fair to say that the George Floyd moment was a moment of reckoning for this country and it, and it woke everyone up in a new way on a new level. But long before George Floyd uttered those words, I can't breathe, black and brown people in this country couldn't breathe. We, this country has had our foot on their necks for generations uh, around not allowing, not, not, not making policy such that that black and brown people have health care, that they can own property, acquire wealth, all of those things that require policy change. And so the challenges right now are that we're in a pandemic and it's hard to, uh, it's hard to gather in person to really make these moves. The protests are powerful and I've been at the protests and I will continue to go to the protests, but we put ourselves at risk in going to those, but that's one of the places where 
some of us, I think, have to put our bodies on the line in the world fighting racism right now. But it, the challenge really is how do we come together in this moment when we are needing to physically distance from one another to really have a voice to fight these uh, injustices and to fight racism in our country. Um, the other challenge I will name real quick is this, this is not a sprint. The work that has to be done is a marathon in this country. And we have to be committed to running the marathon. And you know, in moments like this, everybody gets excited and everybody gets ready to fight the good fight. And then, you know, a month later, two months later, three months later, uh, it kind of, things start going back to normal and then people uh, get uh, relaxed again. And, and so one of the challenges is how do you keep, how do you keep the passion and the urgency of this moment in which we all know that, that we have to change? How do you keep that in people uh, that they embody that and live that out, and it's not just something that uh, is a is a flame that that burns bright for a moment and then diminishes quickly. We can't allow that to happen, and it's always a challenge uh, to keep that energy in people and in in our churches moving forward. I share Keskin Sagam. We have difficult weeks behind us. How did you experience uh, these weeks of lockdown, shutdown? With, how experienced you with this, with your family and with your community? So on the one hand, it was really nice to be home with my children. And my husband also worked from home. It was nice. And uh, where we live, it's very quiet. It's very nice. Um, we have a plenty of room so we can be outside as well as inside. Um, it was nice. But on the other hand, um, everything was also during Ramadan. So we were on a spiritual roller coaster. We were fasting. We, are try we tried to get closer to God. But then reading the news, seeing that black and brown bodies once again here in the United States uh, are killed, getting killed, um, made me think of my role as a spiritual leader, as an educator, what I can do, what I should do to change this situation. Um, I'm still in the process to figure out what I have to do because uh, the question of race in the United States is very different than we have in Germany and I'm still learning about racism in the United States and I'm discovering my own privileges as a white uh, Muslim woman in the United States who is well-educated, who is a citizen. Um, I'm, I'm learning how to instrumentalize my privileges to fight this fight. Um, I'm learning, I'm in process. And how did you experience, I mean, President Trump uh, ex appeared before a church with a Bible in his hand, so religion was politically instrumentalized. And uh, this is normally something that people say that they, Islam is doing that. So how are you experienced with this very special situation? So, um, I mean, Trump is not the first president and it, he, he will not be the last one uh, because religion is something people always use uh, to gain more power. Um, and um, it is a global effect. Like many people are, many leaders try to use their sacred text as a weapon to get more powerful in their own context. So, um, so and then the role of, of like the role of the spiritual leaders is very tricky because on the one hand, we have to show our community that our leaders are using religion as a weapon, but on the other hand, we have to stay in our role as a spiritual uh, uh, spiritual, spiritual leader. I think one way of doing this is to educate our communities and to show them the right way of interpretation of our sacred books, uh, to show how to read it, how to do it. This is the first way. And the most important thing uh, that believing people from all backgrounds, they have to understand this, that politicians, they run the state, but they do not run our faith. And we have to separate these both. 
Yeah, well, so somehow if I would take all these three statements together, I would say that could be also the program of the House of One. So be with a, being with a society, be understanding the needs of the people and uh, not trying uh, not to misuse our different uh, traditions and holy uh, scriptures for uh, uh, unfair political argumentation. So, yeah, we should also in the future come together on this uh, uh, way, which is connecting continents and religions and people. And um, now we all in our tradition should say a prayer for this very difficult year in which we are. It's a year with Corona, with uh, uh, a lot of uh, movement also in politics uh, against uh, the, the, uh, the peace in the world. So let's all in, uh, in our own tradition say a prayer for the future, for a good future uh, of people. So I would say, Alenu Adonai Eloheinu, Et hashana zohot, vay shenatinu keshanim hatohot, yehi ratzon mifanecha, Adonai Elohai velohi avotai, shetishlach mehera refua shlema, u parnasa tova le korbanot shemakat hakeona, baru atarnai mevarech hashanim. Bless us a lot, O oh God, this year and bless this year as good years. May it be your will in front of you, O Lord, my God, and the Lord of my ancestors, that you quickly send a complete recovery and blessed income to the victims of the corona. Blessed are you, O Lord, who blesses all the years. Amen. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials to good endure, spare us. From, from the grip of all that is evil, free us. I offer this Franciscan benediction. May God bless us with this comfort at easy answers, half truths, and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, for freedom, and peace. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. One of the most well-known prayers in Judaism is the last sentence of a long prayer that we call the Amidah, the standing prayer. It's a couple of lines that's a prayer about peace. It's a prayer for peace. Peace in Hebrew is shalom. And we often think about shalom just as the absence of war and conflict. We forget that there is a deeper le level to the root of the word, shalem, which is shlemut, which is wholeness, the healing of that which is broken. So um, I will adapt this very well-known line and say shlemut instead of shalom, which is more than the absence of peace, but it is a realm among us in which we can meet without hurting, and instead for the purpose of healing. O se shlemut bimoma, huya se shlemut aleinu, ve'al kol Yisrael, ve'imu himu amen. Ya se shlemut, ya se shlemut, Shelemut aleinu ve'al kol yosh ve'tevel v'imeru amen. A prayer based on the peace prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. 
When there is injury, pardon. Where there is darkness, light. We bring, gracious God, before you all people who are persecuted or disregarded. Make us an instrument of your peace and let us be by your side with all our strength and with our faith. Be merciful to you and us and give us a peaceful coexistence on our one earth. Amen. God, Lord of the heavens and earth, you have created us mankind in diversity so that we may get to know each other, as you say, so that we tackle the problems we have together, to respect and love the beauty of our different color, faith and language. This is your will. O oh Lord, give us insight of the beauty you created and give us strength to overcome the false structures and attitudes within our societies, to change our mankind for a better. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam, tabarak tayyad al jalal wal ikram. O Allah, you are the perfect peace, and peace comes from you. Blessed are you, O owner of majesty and honor. Give us peace in this world. Amen. <laughs>